So they said it couldn't be done. They said women couldn't organize across race and class, let alone in hundreds of cities around the world on the same day. But women came out March 8, 2017 and took part in a global day of women's action. Why? What motivated them? What do they want to get out of this? We'll find out on The Laura Flanders Show just ahead, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. In 1908, women workers marched in their tens of thousands through the streets of New York City, demanding shorter hours, safer working conditions, better pay and voting rights. A year later, in accordance with a declaration by the Socialist Party of America, the first National Women's Day was observed in February. Then the idea of an International Women's Day came soon after at an international conference, again, of working women in Copenhagen. Much of the world has celebrated International Women's Day every March 8th since about then. The U.S. has been pretty lukewarm about it all, but that seems to be changing. What is going on and why? Why does it matter? We have two conversations coming up. First, Sarah Leonard and Jodine Ogun-Taylor. Jodine is the Vice President of Policy and Strategic Partnerships at Demos and one of the co-organizers of the GOP Hands Off Me campaign. Sarah Leonard is a senior editor at The Nation, co-editor of The Future We Want, Radical Ideas for the New Century, and a member of the steering committee for the International Women's Strike, March 8th. International Women's Day is seeing a huge mobilization this year. Um, how come, what has driven it, and why is 2017 different for women in the United States and worldwide? Well, obviously having an explicitly misogynist, uh, pussy-grabbing president has had a strong influence on women's feeling of being under threat. Um, but I think it's also the culmination of many years of feeling under threat. And one thing we can learn from Europe is we have seen the rise of very tr similar political figures to Trump, right? Mm -hmm. And all of these sort of quasi-authoritarian leaders want to take away reproductive rights and increase austerity. And so women are being asked to bear the brunt of neoliberalism because everybody has to work now because wages are low. At the same time, the social safety net is shredding. So women have to do the care work, have to do the wage work. Something has to give. And I think women in Europe, places like Poland, have been saying, no, that's enough. And I think women in the U.S. are seeing that and responding to that as a model for resistance mm -hmm. against Trump. There's also a Latin American piece of this, too. I was at a meeting yesterday about the women's strike where messages were broadcast from Brazil and Argentina. What's that connection? I think there's a really incredible building of international solidarity amongst women's organizations. The Grassroots, Justice, um, Grassroots Alliance for Global Justice does a lot of connecting women of color, specifically women of color-led um, organizing base building groups to international groups. And it's been really moving as a, as a social movement that is moving from this moment of resistance and grievance to a moment of wanting to have governance and believing that not only are we and have we been the people in the streets leading the resistance for so long, but especially as we sit and see the sexual predator occupying the Oval Office, we're also increasingly running towards the halls of Congress, running towards the halls of our city councils and saying we actually want to be governing because we have a vision that this can be a country and a world for all of us, not just for the elite pussy grabbers. <laughs> now, Hillary Clinton wanted a role in governance. Um, is that what you mean? Is that what you're talking about? No, absolutely not. Um, I'm talking about people who have deep roots relationship in, relationships in their communities, women who have been organizing without it being called that for a long time. I learned from my mother, who organized for years to open up a bilingual elementary school, that part of being a woman, part of being a person in your community is just understanding the needs of the people around you and how they're interconnected. Mm -hmm. This discussion around a strike has gotten a lot of attention. There have been women's strikes, withdrawal of women's labor. Um, this time around, people are saying it's a much broader question or, or it looks like a whole lot of things when a woman strikes in the sense that much of our work is never recognized or even visible in the first place. Absolutely. And one 
historical example you can trace this to is the wages for housework movement in Italy in the 70s where women said, you think that the only work, you men on the left, is the work that you do in factories, but we're doing work too. Society would not function without our reproductive labor, whether that's cleaning up, taking care of you, you know, maintaining the household, and we want to be recognized for that. And so they demanded wages for housework as a way of making that labor visible. Um, and also as a way of saying no to it, because if it's a wage job, you can go on strike. And how does all of this relate to the big demonstrations that happened the day after the inauguration of President Trump? It happened all around the world. Well, it follows right on that, right? So right now we have this political system that has created an economy that grinds down almost everybody, the 99%, you have a 1% who's running the show. We heard a lot about that during the election. And it's become a sort of common sense for people that that's the case. Um, and over the last several years, what we've seen is an attempt to make uh, famous, successful women essentially the exceptions to that rule mm -hmm. um, into the face of feminism. And instead, this sort of movement of a lot of women together says, we want feminism to actually be a threat to the system that's keeping the vast majority of us down. And so when you see women from every walks of life going on strike in all kinds of different ways, the massive solidaristic outpouring right after the election, you see the possibility of saying that's what feminism looks like. Feminism looks like this 99%. It doesn't look like one woman in a C-suite. What are the demands of the, of the movement, whether you call it a strike or an action movement? Well, crucial to the entire structure of the strike is that there are a lot of local actions. So people are organizing in their communities and they have different demands and different needs. So while we assume certain things are common to everybody in the movement, like reproductive justice, you know, that's a broad goal, in every city and state that looks a little different. So in New York, we're looking at maybe passing comprehensive um, health care, and we are considering what role contraception and abortion coverage will have in that legislation. That's extremely important here. In Chicago, there are different things on the table. In DC, they're marching to the White House. So it actually, it depends quite a bit. As people work together in things like the women's strike, and we build these very strong networks, which are really still just in development, mm -hmm. Um, we're going to see more of a national program coming to the fore, and I think there's going to be a lot of debate over that. One of my questions is about the relationship of this organizing to other types of organizing, and you're both touching on it, but I'd love to hear more. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of socialists involved in what's happening this March. There are also people involved in immigration rights movements, the sanctuary movement. How do these movements relate? And I guess a crystallizing question, given the history that we've lived with over the centuries as women, is is this a coalition that can be split in the old ways? One of the points of light <laughs> after the election is that we have come to see how we need each other now more than ever. You're confident and, about that? You know, I am. I feel like there is a level of movement coordination that we are seeing now that we have not seen in a long time. And Describe it. So what does that look like to you? Or where do you see that? So, you know, there's a table called the Resistance Table led by Demos, Move On, the National Domestic Workers Alliance and Color of Change. And we come together in a war room that consists of, you know, close to 100 national organizations. And we, it's less about coordinating one campaign and more talking about our overall goals for the movement ecosystem and at which times our different bases, different issues need to be in the forefront so that we stay connected and how we can, in a deeper way, relate to each other's issues. And, and socialism is coming back into this conversation. People are quoting the feminists of the early internationals, the socialist internationals, mm -hmm. whether it's Clara Zetkin or Alexandra Kollontai, whomever. That language is coming back. Where do you see that in this whole development? It became clear over the course of the last election that the main public figure who was standing in distinction to both the political establishment and sexist, misogynist, garbage candidates was Bernie Sanders, who identified as a socialist. Now, Bernie Sanders is not a perfect representation of the left in this country, um, but he brought a sort of representation of socialism to people that was really legible, um, that it's about redistribution, it's about control over your own life. And people thought, oh, well, socialism appears to be an alternative to this system that is working extremely badly for us. So vision moment. Um 
all of this sounds great, but it is, and it is also still true that amongst the demands of the, of the action is full provisioning, which I read as kind of a reinforcement of the welfare net, of the, of the social safety net. I vision a future, a feminist international global future that is post-capitalist and has an actual society, doesn't need a net for the people that fall through. What's your vision? If, if all this goes according to plan and the, your, your, your best case scenario, how will the history of this moment be written? Jodine. I think one thing is that we um, move away from a place where people's economic anxiety is manipulated and turned into racialized anxiety. Um, I think that's a lot of what we saw in this last election. Um, people who had you know, lost their jobs, fear of what would happen in the economy. And it, became, it tells the story that um, if you drain the swimming pool of economic opportunity, instead of letting black folks, native folks, Muslims also swim, we actually will drain the pool for all of us. And so I think it's about getting away from this idea that only some of us in a world are able to succeed instead of really deeply, not just saying, but believing that until we're working for the well-being of all of us who do share this social space, as you said, that there's always going to be a, an ability to manipulate, to divide, so that one person has all the water, but at, really that just leaves all the water sipping out of the pool. And do women feminists have a special, you know, purchase on that argument, on that work? Yes, actually. Um, because one of the ways that the state has declined to provide for people, and one of the ways that community has been degraded, is by saying, all of these things you have to do to take care of each other, that's not a social problem, that's your personal problem. You, in the household, which is usually a woman, you deal with that. You do the childcare, you do the cooking, you maintain everybody for the labor force, you work in the labor force. Um, and among the things that would be involved in full social provisioning are, of course, universal childcare, universal affordable or free or public housing. All the things that we have privatized that are actually things that are common needs for every single person, many of them fit within the traditional domain of women, actually. And we're very well positioned to look at them and say, there's nothing natural about this. This doesn't feel good, you know? And this is something that actually we can do together. Um, and we're going to show you what those things are. And I think that this strike actually does that. Sarah Leonard. Joe Dean, Ogun Taylor, thank you so much, both of you. It's great talking to you. We could clearly do a, a year of programming on exactly this. We have much more coming up. You can get more information about everything we've been discussing on our website, but don't go away. We've got more on this topic next. After the massive marches on the day after President Trump's inauguration, organizers called March 8, 2017 the beginning of a new international feminist movement. Don't tell the Donald, it's not in fact all about him. The goal, organizers say, is to resist not just Trump and his misogynist policies, but also the conditions that produced Trump and Trumpism, namely decades-long economic inequality, racial and sexual violence, and imperial wars around the world. Two more women who have been involved in all this join me now. Nalini Stamp is the National Membership Director for the Working Families Party. We first met at Occupy Wall Street. Chinsia Arutza is an Assistant Professor of Philosophy at the New School for Social Research in New York. Welcome both, glad to have you. So to continue this conversation, there is a global aspect to all of this that is happening this March. Um, talk a bit about that, Chintia, because as I've admitted before, I think on this program, um, I used to think socialist feminism was the only kind of feminism there is. Um, <laughs> I was wrong. And I've grown to understand the big divisions between European feminist traditions and traditions in the United States. You must be aware of that too. You're from Italy, right? The various uh, uh, traditions of feminism in, uh, in Europe have actually, um, especially in the last 20 years, uh, um, had little to do with socialist feminism. Socialist feminism was uh, predominant, especially in the, in the 70s and 80s in the Anglo-American world, but uh, a bit less so in, uh, in Europe. But what is interesting now is that uh, there is a return to socialist feminism, uh, or in any case to a class-based uh, feminism in Europe as well. 
And, um, and uh, this is also characterizing the efforts uh, around the, the international women's strike because the, um, the idea around this, the strike is that uh, we cannot approach uh, um, we, issues concerning women's rights, reproductive uh, justice, uh, uh, civil rights, without also addressing uh, structural problems like uh, um, capitalism, uh, neoliberalism and war. So this is a big change. What's at stake? What's at stake for you, Nili, and the people you work with in the Workers Family, Working Families Party? What's at stake is the future. I mean, what's at stake is making sure that people can live with the roof over their head. People are still being kicked out of their homes in the U.S. And just because we aren't talking about it on a massive level as we were five or six years ago, it's still it's still happening. Um, black women are particularly losing their sons and their daughters to either the mass incarceration system or through police violence. So there is so much at stake. And when we take in um, neoliberalism and capitalism and and structural racism and structural white supremacy that's global, right? White supremacy is, is making a comeback in a really way in, 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 in situations of power. How do you answer that question, Chinsu? If I can answer this question by referring to what happened during the primaries in the Democratic Party. Sure. Um, so there we, we saw uh, what the problem was. Uh, there, there was the idea that uh, women should support Hillary Clinton no matter what. Uh, also, you know, against uh, Bernie Sanders because she was a woman and because she was representing women's rights. But this uh, precisely didn't take into account the fact that uh, we can, when we speak about the half of the population, we are speaking of uh, women living in uh, countries that have, have been bombed by the United States, uh, migrant women, uh, working class women. All these women, of course, uh, uh, have uh, needs and desires and, uh, and demands that cannot be answered only uh, by what we call corporate feminism or lean-in fe feminism. They must be answered by addressing the structural problems. So, uh, precisely, uh, starting from war in particular and imperialist attacks but also you know immigration policies a welfare state and so on so uh, otherwise um, these women are completely left behind now we should say there's imperialist wars there's also extreme religious wars whether you're talking in this country at the domestic level or more dramatically uh, at the level of isis H how does that situation integrate into this where women's bodies again seem to be a battlefield having to do with signaling male power. It is precisely a battlefield and uh, on two sides in the sense that of course there is a, a, a war against women by ISIS and, and Kurdish women are fighting this, uh, this, this struggle for uh, all of us. But there is also uh, another war against women uh, coming from, for, for example, from European governments uh, who are also the United States that are using uh, the, the, um, the reference to women's bodies, to women's lives as an excuse, as a justification of, to continue imperialist attacks. And uh, in, in Europe, this is particularly re relevant because we are facing a, a wave of uh, Islamophobia uh, that is arriving in the States too now. Um, that is extremely worrying, and this uh, wave of Islamophobia very often uh, co-opts uh, some uh, uh, pseudo-feminist arguments. Mm. So, for example, we have to free these uh, uh, this, uh, poor uh, veiled women from these barbaric uh, uh, Muslim men. Uh, so I think we are uh, in, in the middle between these uh, two opposite forces, that uh, none of which is actually really in favor of women's rights and women's lives. And then this is why it is so important to have a feminist movement that actually reclaims what, what it means to be feminist. You are in the middle of this, um, Nalini, as you work with the Working Families Party around running for office, where these questions come up a lot. Well, we should back the conservative because they have a better chance of getting in. Um, even if they perhaps aren't good on reproductive justice, but they are good on taxes, those kinds of calculations we've known forever. Um, how are you seeing things change or are they changing? I believe they are. Um, I think that, well, structurally, they're probably not uh, with the election of the Democratic Party chair of Tom Perez um, and not Keith Ellison, right? Um, there was this, and there was a lot of is Islamophobic statements going into that, saying that Keith Ellison was going to drive away all of the Jewish folks who are, who align themselves with the Democratic Party. He was the first Muslim, Muslim American in the House. Yes, first Muslim American in the House. I believe the first Muslim candidate to run for the the uh, chair of the DNC. For sure. And um, you know, and and instead of really going behind and going in, I mean, you had Chuck Schumer 
support Keith Ellison, right? You had folks who were who haven't had the best record on 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 um, issues of the economy, and they were and they were going in because they wanted to see a future of the party. And people were whipping votes for Tom Perez, and it just signified the same old, same old. We are at this choice point where, and we've seen it on a local level. Actually, New York City's mayoral election was a really good. People are like, we have to vote Christine Quinnen because she's a woman and she's a lesbian, and we can have the first woman lesbian be the the mayor of of New York City. But she supported stop and frisk at the time. Now, we won't talk about de Blasio's record now on issues of policing because it hasn't been that great, but the voters decided they wanted to vote their values and vote the issues that they care about. And I think that we have to actually start making, we have to primary folks. We need to train uh, women, particularly women of color, working class women of color to run for office to primary Democrats because I think that's the only way we're going to win this battle is to show better options on the ballot. And are people standing up? To that, I mean, are they rushing to, to, to run for office given everything Hillary Clinton went through? You might think people say, I don't want to deal with that. I think so. I, well, I think, I, I think you're right. There's definitely, I don't want to have to deal with that. There's also the stigma of you have to be wealthy, you have to be, because how much elections cost, right? We understand that this is, I mean, it's part of the problem um, with our, our, our elections and we don't have public financing everywhere of elections. But I do think that there is this, this, this excitement now. Um, people, when Bernie asked, who wants to, when our revolution came out who wants to run for office like 5,000 people raised their hands basically and said I want I want to run for office we have people within uh, who have been contacting Working Families Party um, saying I want to go to a candidate training we had 300 people show up in Long Island um, out of all places to learn how to run for office and so I do think that there's the urge and the need there but we don't just have to train people to run for office we need to train them to have the values the vision for what we need in a society and we need to train the people the political operatives who are behind them because also in the US um, I don't know what it's like abroad but political operatives are, are, are half of the problem as well, the folks who, who pull the strings behind the candidates and tell them who to listen to and who not to. Finally, both of you, for people who are wanting to get involved or wanting to learn more, it's not like you can turn on the feminist channel on TV <laughs> and get a quick education about the history of international feminism. Where do they go while we make that TV network? So uh, we have a website, <laughs> www.womenstrikeus.org. And it will continue after March 8th? It, it will continue. We, we, I think we want to continue. This is, March 8th is only the beginning. And on the website, uh, people who want to get involved can find the information and also the contacts. Uh, because we, we have, in, over the course of, uh, of three weeks, basically, we have uh, really received a lot of contacts uh, from people who wanted to organize in their city. So everybody is welcome to... Uh, join the, this effort. This is a very large and pluralistic coalition. So, and the action really does continue after March eighth. You think? Absolutely. I mean, we we can't just just stop. I mean, people thought the action wasn't going to continue after the women's march, and clearly that's happening, right? It's going to take a little bit of time, but with so many movements that are in this right now, so many people from different communities who are who are standing up for the first time and getting involved and doing something, I absolutely believe. And we have, t I mean, the science march is coming up. There's so many different days of action that I really do feel like it's great that different communities are speaking up for what they want to see, and and we'll see that. The the question that I always have is um, how can we how can we make it last for not just the year and not just two years but ten years and decades and decades. Nilini, Cinzia, thank you so much and uh, keep up the great fight. You're watching the Laura Flanders show. Thanks. It's exciting. At last, U.S. women are getting in on the act, celebrating International Working Women's Day. After all, it was an event in the U.S. that helped give it its start. It was 1909 in the crowded Great Hall at New York's Cooper Union. A big union boss was talking about talks. And things were moving slowly when a 16-year-old girl shouted out from the back, Walk out! More than 30,000 shirtwaist factory workers walked off their jobs after that, the biggest worker walkout in New York history up to that point. The leaders were mostly young immigrant women like that 16-year-old, Clara Lemlish. 700 women were arrested, many more beaten and spat on for being on strike against God, so they said. They struck for 11 weeks and inspired the European socialists who later resolved to mark International Working Women's Day, partly in their honor. Appreciation is nice, but it doesn't itself 
save lives. In 1911, two years later, a fire broke out in another factory, the Triangle Shirt Waste Factory in New York City, a fire of exactly the sort the 09 strikers had been afraid of. That fire killed 146 workers, again, mostly women and girls, mostly immigrants, several of whom leapt to their deaths from upper floor windows to escape the flames. All these years on, more people remember the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, and they can name the dead. But what fewer people remember are the demands those women and girls made, not just for wage increases, but for the ability to have a say in the conditions of their lives, their workplace conditions, and to have workplaces that didn't kill them. Those are the rights that will be taken from American workers, the labor movement says, if the GOP Trump agenda goes ahead today. Imagine, a century ago, if the rest of New York had stood with the women of those factories. Imagine if instead of 20,000 or 30,000, it had been 2 million workers marching. Or if it were to be today. Celebration's nice. Listening is even better. And it's never too late to get started organizing. I'm Laura Flanders. You can write to me, tell me what you think. That's Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com. And find all our programming at our website. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.